Good evening and welcome to our program. I'm Stan Adams with the Word and Sword TV broadcast and we're coming to you in our 32nd year and we're glad to be with you. Uh, be finishing up this year quicker than we thought. Uh, this, this next show will be in September and it's uh, we're moving on past. And so we've enjoyed coming to you this year and uh, we are now in a format for this, for this program and probably one or two more where we're just uh, dealing with Bible questions and you can call in at any point during the program if you would like and we will certainly take care of your question because this is your uh, program also. We appreciate you inviting us into your home tonight and letting us be there uh, to study the Bible with you. This is the Word and Sword TV broadcast. It is all about God's Word. We're going to be studying God's Word and if you would get your Bibles and make sure that what we're teaching is from God's Word <clears throat> because we could lie to you. We could tell you something that the Bible says that it doesn't say and you need, to, you need to check us out on that and make sure that what we're preaching is from God's Word. We invite you to do that. You find us not to be doing that. You'd be our friend to let us know. And uh, so we want to take the whole counsel of God, not just cherry pick a passage and run through the Bible and pick out our favorites but to deal with all of what God's Word says on a subject. If you have a Bible question tonight, feel free to call in throughout the program and we would be glad to deal with your question. We th Again, thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, there is a gospel meeting taking place in Lincolnton, North Carolina with Connie Adams who was uh, with us in Newton for a meeting a few uh, months ago. And uh, so he's over there this week preaching each night and uh, that service is at 7.30. And that uh, building, if you have any, uh, want to know any information about how to get there, please call in. Our operators will be glad to tell you uh, how to get to that uh, location and hear God's Word preached each night. Uh, that's going out of style. You know, the, go the gospel is the power of God into salvation. And we believe it will still draw the right kind of people. People that are hungry and thirsty for what the Word of God teaches. And if you're that way, you'll be uh, more than pleased with your attendance with the Lincoln Church of Christ in, uh, over in Lincolnton. So um, take advantage of that opportunity at 7.30 each night through Friday night over there. We want you to be aware that we are the Word and Sword broadcast and that we do have uh, several opportunities for you to study the Bible in your home. You can call in tonight at 828-485-5555 and ask for a copy of this presentation in printed form or by PC data disk. And we'll be glad to provide that for you, again, free of charge. We don't charge your postage. We don't charge anything. So you just let us know uh, what you would desire uh, from the program, and we'll be glad to get that to you. Also, a free Bible correspondence course. Uh, we're getting toward the end of the year, fall getting ready to come up, and winter. What better way to spend those nights and uh, around the fire than studying God's Word and answering some Bible questions, an organized study of God's Word with the free Bible correspondence course. We have two of those, and so you just let us know which one you want. Call our operators, give them your information. We will not spam you. We will not sell your information to someone else, and we will not irritate you to death. So you just let us know what you would like to have, and we will be glad to get that to you. You can also ask for a free tract. Call in and ask for one of those. Uh, we will be glad to, to get that to you. A tract is nothing but a written sermon. And uh, we'll be glad to get you uh, that on a subject that you uh, might have in mind. Just let us know what the subject is, and we'll do our best to find a tract or a sermon that will go along with that. You can also call in and ask for a map on how to get to our building. We meet at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, and if you uh, don't know how to get around up there, we, we will be glad to direct you with a free map if you just call us. Also ask to be added to our monthly bulletin called The Beacon to that mailing list, and that comes out, we'll mail it out quarterly, and you can be a, a regular reader of our written material that we have, a collection of uh, writings from brethren from all over the country. Also, you can get free PowerPoint, video, and audio by going to www.wordandsword.com. And if you are not a computer person, just call us and we will get, make sure we get those to you. If you'll just let us know. We have a lot of material up there on the site and we would urge you to access that. And uh, if you don't, if, again, if you're not a computer person, just let us know what you would like to hear from uh, programs in the past or anything along a subject and we'll do our best to try to find that for you and send it to you, again, free of charge. 
Tonight we would like to ask you to call with a biblical question or, or comment. If you do not want to come on the air, that's perfectly all right. Uh, you just give your question to our operator and we will deal with your question on the air. And uh, if you would like to uh, have feedback, you might want to come on the air with us. But we understand some people are just shy and they don't want to come on the air, and that's okay too. So just let us know your Bible question. We're here to find out what God's Word teaches. Receive a biblical book, chapter, and verse answer, and if we cannot get you one, we will certainly start off the program the next time with uh, dealing with your question. Also, we would like to, we're froze up here, um, so we'll get, to get going here in a minute. Uh, Paul, as a brother said last night, I don't guess Paul ever had any uh, electronical problems. So, uh, but we're in electronic age. So, anyway, uh, we'd also like you to watch us on face or uh, to like us on Facebook, if you will. Uh, www.facebook.com/wordandsword, and also follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword. Uh, post on either one of those mediums a biblical uh, question or comment, and we'll have a discussion online if you would like. Receive a biblical book, chapter, and verse answer. And we've had some people that have done that, and we appreciate that so much. Answers to our Bible questions is, again, what we'll be dealing with tonight. And we urge you to get your Bibles and turn to them as we go into our study. You can call tonight to speak live to us on the air with your biblical question or comment and receive a biblical book, chapter, and verse answer. 828-485-5555. The subject of being lost is not a pleasant subject. None of us wants to think of ourselves as being lost. It's just not a pleasant subject. But the fact is that if we live to an age of accountability, if we get old enough, we're going to fall into sin. Romans 3.23 says, All sin and fall short of the glory of God. That sin will come into our lives is inevitable. Now we do not inherit someone else's sin. We do not inherit uh, Adam's sin. We are not born evil. We are not born totally depraved and wholly inclined to mischief, as one uh, as John Calvin taught. But we do understand that we are to become as little children. Little children are innocent. They are not evil. And uh, we are to be uh, like them in the kingdom of the Lord. But when we fall into sin, when we f are drawn away by our own lust, James chapter 1, verses uh, 12 through 14, when we're drawn away by our own lust and enticed and succumb to sin, then there is a consequence that comes with that. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. And that is a lost condition before God. Now, we all know what it's like when we don't, if you've never been lost, you will be at some point. If you try to get around Hickory, North Carolina, for instance, you're going to get lost. Uh, this, this town is a tough town to get around, the toughest I've ever been in. Uh, I don't know how many streets and circles and drives and everything you can put on one signpost, but uh, they seem to be making a, a lot of progress with that. But I, I don't even know where I am in town. I know how to get two or three places, but I'm, I find myself lost an awful lot, don't you? Uh, maybe you don't. Uh, some men never get lost. They just meander around until they find their way because they won't ask anybody. But that's the way it is also about spiritual things. A lot of people are lost in sin and will not heed the record to see where they are. God's GPS, if you please. Because God tells us how to find the way in His Word. He tells us how to come out of darkness. He tells us, He gives us a guide, and He is the constant in our lives. We can always find our way home by going to God. And so we want to think, think about that seriously as we go into our lesson tonight about we're lost. And people that are lost need to be saved. If you're lost tonight, if you're out of relationship with God, you don't need to stay that way. That's the good message, the good news of the gospel, is that you don't need to stay lost. You don't need to be in a lost condition. Don't need to give up and say, God, I'm just too horrible. God will never save me. He can save the vilest of sinners. And He will do that if we will do what He tells us to do in keeping with His Word, finding our direction. Before we go any further into our lessons tonight, I want to answer some, some questions that were submitted. Uh, we got one in the mail that was submitted the old-timey way, and we thank you for that. Someone sent us one with no uh, return address. Wish we did have that. But uh, they sent us a, a, a piece of a book that they had copied called When Critics Ask by Norman Geisler and Thomas Howell. 
<clears throat> in that, one of the questions that's asked is, what about Acts 2.38? And they highlighted this and said, did Peter declare that baptism was necessary for salvation? And Mr. Howe and Mr. Geisler go into an examination of that, and they come to the conclusion, and I'll just read this, the solution to what is said in Acts 2.38 to be baptized for remission of sins is resolved when we consider the possible meaning of being baptized for remission of sins. And what they're saying here is that the word for uh, can mean with a view to or even because of. Well, that's just flat not true in the Greek. Um, I don't know who Mr. Geisler and Mr. Howe are, but they did not give an accurate presentation of the Greek in that. There are at least nine words in the Greek. Depending on the vernacular of Greek you're using, there are at least nine words for the, our English word for, F-O-R. The word that is used, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and look and see what was said. Now the gospel is being preached there for the first time to those in Jerusalem. It's going forth from Jerusalem as was prophesied. And in verse 37 it says, Now when they heard this they were pricked in their hearts. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said uh, unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, the word ice is the word for for there. The word ice means in order to obtain. That's the Greek meaning of E-I-S. Okay? And that is the word that's used in Acts chapter 8 or chapter 2 and verse 38. For remission of sins. That is in order to obtain. And someone would say, well, uh, how do we know there's different words? Well, we don't, I don't, we don't go around speaking Greek. I don't and you don't either. But it is always important to go back and see what the original writer was writing, what the, what the impact of the words was. And that's really how we study the Bible. We find out as best we can what the word means, kind of how we understand anything that we read. If I don't understand it, I go get a dictionary and look up the word. And so that's the case with for. If I understand that for can mean different things, different uh, Greek words can be used for for, I want to be sure I find out what that means. And certainly, if Acts 2.38, it means in, uh, because my sins are already remitted, then that would certainly make a difference, wouldn't it? That would change everything. We would certainly not be teaching the truth on Acts 2.38 if that was the case. But it doesn't say that. And you can't make a passage say something that it doesn't say because of your doctrine not fitting it. And that seems to be what Mr. Geisler and Mr. Howe have done here. Because every Greek scholar that you go to, and I'm by far not a Greek scholar, but I know enough Greek to get me in trouble. But what we see here on this word for is elementary Greek. And there are nine, again, at least nine words for it. And the, the, there are two of them used in verse 38 and 39. Now I want you to look at the way that verse 39 starts. That is the, the Greek word gar for. See? You have verse 39 says for. It is unto you and to your children and unto all those that are far off as many as call on the name of the Lord. The promise is unto you and to your children and all those that are, that, uh, that are far off. Now he's referring there to the word because. That is the word. G-A-R is the word because. And that's what he uses in verse 39, tying the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit that is given there to everyone that's obedient to the gospel to the promise that was given, the promise to Abraham that through thy seed all nations shall be blessed. That's salvation to all men. That happens whenever someone is baptized into Christ. We are baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. In order to obtain remission, that is the force of the passage. That's what the Greek says. And then the word gar, which does mean because of, is used in verse 39. Isn't that interesting? He does not use it in verse 38. You have two words for used, and some, some evidently Mr. Geisler and Mr. Howe assume that since gar was used in 39, they just go back and say it had to be used in 38. No, it doesn't. 
And you're going to find that throughout Scripture. You need to look up words and see what they mean. And you don't have to be a Greek scholar to do that. You can get you a good book that will tell you those things. Uh, a Greek dictionary, it will tell you those things. English Greek, English to Greek, and it will tell you these things. So keep those things in mind as you go through there and be awfully cautious about what you read somebody say. And even with us, be careful what you check me out on this. I mean, you go down to the library or you talk to someone, call someone who is a Greek scholar and ask them how many words there are for the word for. And what is the word in Acts 2 and verse 38? And they will tell you it's ice, E I S. And then in verse 39, you will find that that is the word gar. Now, there are other words that are used for the word for, but that's the two used here. And you do not need to get them, get them confused. One means because of, and one means in order to obtain. So let's look at verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. One version says, unto the remission of sins. All right? So you have to do these things in order to obtain the remission of sins. So that's a very clear passage when we read it that way, right? <clears throat> but certainly if we're going to insert the word gar there, it takes on a whole different meaning. So three letters, E-I-S or G-A-R, make a lot of difference. You see how we have to read carefully, not just read the Bible, not just read it with our rose-colored glasses of our particular belief, but read it as, it's, as it says and see what is meant. We don't want to be lost. So let's think seriously about that, and uh, we appreciate the, the, uh, whoever sent this in, uh, that you would uh, send this in to us. Also, they make the point in Mark 16, 16, uh, that not once in the entire Gospel of John does it give baptism as a part of the condition of salvation. Well, the book of John deals with <clears throat> different events of Christ's life. But John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Now Jesus preached and gave the Gospel and had the Holy Spirit uh, as the Comforter come to the Apostles to guide them into all truth. John is a historical record of the life of Christ. We understand that. He deals with only seven of the miracles. So that you could make the argument that John doesn't deal with all the miracles so they didn't happen. But that would be a false argument, wouldn't it? because He doesn't deal with every one of them. He deals with seven of them. So does that argue that the other miracles didn't happen? No. Look at the other biographical accounts of Jesus. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 does teach that, and Jesus taught His apostles. Go ye therefore, go ye into all the world, or go ye therefore and teach all nations. Mark says it this way, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All right. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So those are biographical accounts just like John is. John did not choose to relate every event of Christ's life. He's giving a, 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 a biblical apologetic in the book of John for who Jesus Christ is, tracing Him from His heavenly heritage. But notice there that, 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 that we have to take all of what God's Word says, don't we? All of it. Not just cherry pick it and run through there. Because you can't say because John didn't deal with something that it's not dealt with by Christ. Because Matthew and Mark both do deal with it, don't they? Very clearly. So let's not be dishonest when we look at God's Word. Uh, we want to make sure that we, we honestly look at it and not look at God's Word with a view to trying to prove our point. Yeah? And that's kind of backward reasoning. I find out what I want to believe and then go try to prove it by the Bible. That's not how we do it. We see what God says in His Word and then we conform our lives to what He said. It makes a lot more sense because God's wiser than any of us, isn't He? And all of us can be wrong, but God's never wrong. So that's why He gave us a guide. We're not, we're not the constant in trying to find our way out of being lost. The Lord is, and He gives us His Word. As the psalmist says in Psalm 119, Thy word is a light unto my feet and, uh, and uh, a lamp unto my pathway. Thy word's beautiful. Oh, how love I thy law. It's my meditation day and night. If we did more reading of God's word than we do watching TV, we might be better off people. Not better, might, might, might be, we would be. 
So anyway, if you if you consider those things on the on the idea of baptism, I appreciate the the points that were brought out by Mr. Geisler and Mr. Howe, but they're just flat out wrong and not even scholarly in their approach. And again, that's not because I'm the greatest scholar in the world, but it's because it just doesn't fit. I mean, I can, I can make an argument, I can write a paragraph about something and put out an article and say this is the way it is, and if you don't look it up, you'll never know whether it's that way or not. Check out people, folks. Check out writers, check out preachers, check out everything that your church believes, and make sure that it is from God's Word. Now, does truth have anything to fear from open investigation? It doesn't, does it? But I tell you what does cause problems when you ask for a book, chapter, and verse proof. What does cause problems is people don't want to, they know they don't have proof. Or they don't know it and they think you're just being a troublemaker. Since when was it wrong to appeal to authority? Now in our world we have a problem today with people trying to act without authority. Look what a mess we're in in our country. We threw the Constitution away several years ago. And so people just do what seems right to them. Almost in the time going back to the period of the judges when every man did what was right in his own eyes. I need my rights. Don't care about yours, but I want mine. And you need to give me mine, but I don't have to give you yours. And so that's how things have been turned upside down because we've gone away from a standard, folks. And we've got to get back to a standard. In politics, in our country, it needs to go back to the Constitution. What does the Constitution say? It's not that long a document. It's not that hard to read and understand what we're supposed to do. But you know, we have since the Constitution written more uh, about how to interpret the Constitution than, we, than the Constitution itself entails. So that's, that's dangerous. We've amended the Constitution and we can change law. But notice in the Word of God, the Word of God is a constant. We don't get to do that with God's Word. Can't change it to fit our to fit what we want to do. So think also of this. Um, there was also a caller last uh, our last program who called in and made the point that all those that were ba that died in the flood were baptized by the flood. Well, friends, that's just not true. Uh, the flood was destructive. The flood destroyed them. They died. They had a chance to do what God said, but baptism was not binding under the patriarchal age. And so baptism was not something that they would have been baptized in. Abraham wasn't baptized, you see, because the law he lived under did not require that. But we know the New Testament law does require that. And so that's, that, was, that would be a false idea. Another caller called in a couple of weeks ago and said this, and hope you all are all listening at this time and watching us. And if you disagree with our answers or anything along those lines, please call in again and we'll talk to you live on the air. Maybe get some clarification if I'm misrepresenting what you said. But one caller called in and said that uh, he's a strong believer in baptism. I believe in baptism, but it doesn't say you have to, to be saved. Well, why would, it, by the way, it does say that. It does say that. And so he just says, never, never in the Bible does it say that you have to be baptized to be saved. Enlighten you a little bit if you're, if you're watching. And if you're not, well, this is a good question for all of us to look at. Does the Bible ever say that baptism saves you? It does. In those words, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Do you have your Bibles? Go ahead and turn over there, and let's read that together. Notice what it says, The like figure, whereunto baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now there's a lot of people who will read the last part of that verse, but they don't want to read the first part. They say, well, you're baptized so you have a good conscience. And that's what this, this uh, person that called in, what they were saying. But 1 Peter 3.21, the first part of it says it clearly, folks, in talking about how, how there were eight souls saved by water. That's pretty clear during the days of Noah, which after a true likeness, not a, a likeness. Now, the flood was a likeness, but it was not baptism. When something is like something, it's not that exact thing. It's similar to it. 
all right, in that the flood destroyed those that were lost and the, the waters destroyed those that were lost, but also was the means by which Noah and his family were saved. See, not the means by which everybody was saved, but Noah and his family were saved in the safety of the ark as the waters made it rise, but it sunk everybody else. Okay? Now notice the refusal to be baptized is likened to that, that you're going to be lost if you refuse baptism, because baptism is likened to what Noah did. And Noah was, was uh, obedient to the Lord. Eight souls were saved through water. Now, which also in a true likeness, one version says, now saves us, even baptism. So there it is. Clearly the Bible teaches that baptism is the act that puts you into being saved with the Lord. Galatians 3.27 also teaches us that we put Christ on in baptism. I would imagine that everyone viewing this program tonight believes that we, can't, we have to have Jesus to be saved. Don't you agree with that? I would say every, about 100% of our viewers tonight you, that you believe that. Well, how do I get into Christ? That's the question. I have to have Jesus in my life. How do I do that? Galatians 3.27 says that we put Christ on in baptism. Now verse 26 does include faith. You're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, but there's that word for. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay, that word there is the word gar again, because as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. All right? So we put Christ on in baptism. We don't put him on in faith because the demons would be saved if that was the case. We don't put him on in repentance, just being sorry for what you did and going on doing what you want to from then on. We don't put him on in confessing him. We put him on in baptism. Romans chapter 6 also deals with that, and we'll deal with this a little bit later in our program tonight. Getting back to the idea of being lost, friends, ask yourself right now, am I lost? And you are, if, uh, if, you, if these things are not true. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, go back to the charts if you will. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. All right? So these are talk, it's talking about Jews who were not hearing God's word and doing what he said, and they were blinded by their own laws, and they would not come to the Lord. He says, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus, that is the image of God, should shine on them. They were stubbornly insisting on their ways, their, their religion, and not upon God's, what God said to do. And so they were escaping the beautiful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2 and verse 12, the Ephesians were told that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, talking about Gentiles, having no hope and without God in the world. All right? No hope and without God. That's lost, folks. That's lost. Well, you're also lost, we, any of us are lost if we haven't obeyed the gospel, friends. If you've not obeyed the gospel, we have to do what God told us to do. Jesus said that in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father that is in heaven. All right? So we have to do what God tells us to do. Jesus said that. I didn't say that. Church Christ didn't say that. The Bible says that. Jesus Christ Himself said that in Matthew 7, 21. Now you suppose He knew what He was talking about? Okay. So we just can't say, Lord, Lord, and enter the kingdom. We have to do the will of my Father. Jesus also says, you do, if you don't love me, or if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll do what I say. All right. Now we're also lost unless we, have, unless we obeyed the gospel, and those that obey not the gospel have something terrible look to look forward to. In first Peter 4.17, the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begin with us first, 
What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of Christ? Do you think the apostles and Jesus knew what they were saying when they talked about obedience being a part of God's plan? I think so. You see, that doesn't mean because the Lord told us to obey Him does not mean we're saved by our own obedience. It's the means by which God said we will be saved, that we must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? Now, notice what happens. If we obey the gospel, we will not be punished eternally. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9, written to brethren who were having challenges with, uh, from people without about when was the judgment day coming. He said, I give, you to, uh, I give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those that do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here not obeying the gospel is tantamount to not obeying God. Not obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ is not obeying God. And what happens? These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Friend, you don't want that to happen. You don't want to have to face that. I want to ask you something about being lost for just a moment. Those that are lost will have a place in an eternal hell. It will be a place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And it will be full of everybody that is disobedient to what God says. Come back to the charts if you will. All right. Everyone that's disobedient to what God says. So we have to be obedient to what God says, or we will suffer the, the terrible fate of being lost forever in the devil's hell. And that doesn't have to happen, and God doesn't want it to happen. God is not slack concerning His promise, but He's long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, if we've obeyed the gospel, then we're freed from sin, according to Romans 6, 17, and 18. God be thanked that you were slaves of sin, yet you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and have been set free from sin, and have become slaves of righteousness. So you put off something and you put on something. And now we are slaves to righteousness where we were slaves to sin. You see that in Romans 7, 6, 17, and 18? All right. But we had to obey from the heart to make that transition. Obey the doctrine that the Lord delivered to us. Okay? So that, that's very important that we understand that. All right? So have you obeyed the gospel? Have you done that? How do we obey the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, and in which you stand, by which you are also saved. We are saved by the power of the gospel, Romans 6, 1, 16. Not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. If you hold fast, and here there's the same type of thing said in 1 Corinthians, but he puts this in, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you. So it expands. They don't contradict, but they work off of one another, you see. If you hold fast what I preached to you, unless you believed it for nothing. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. You have to believe that in order to be obedient to the, to the Lord. Well, we're lost also unless we have obeyed the gospel. In Romans 6, verses 1 through 5, notice what is said there about obedience to the gospel. Talking here to Christians and to all of you who don't believe you can fall from grace, read this passage with me. He's talking to Christians here. And then he asks Christians in Rome, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Or God forbid, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, there it is, Galatians 3.27 again, were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of His death, Certainly also we shall be in the likeness of His resurrection, 
So he ties there in Romans chapter 6, friends, he ties Romans chapter 6 to something. He ties it to the, our, our obedience to the gospel in baptism to a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And it's very simple application. Jesus Christ died, He was buried, and He arose for you. Now, we all agree on that, don't we? So what must I do in response? I die to sin, I'm buried in water to receive the blood that saves me, and I'm raised to walk a new life. And I'm no longer a slave to sin. I have turned my back on being a slave to sin, and I'm a slave of righteousness, you see. And I'm not that way until I have been baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. That's that simple. So why would anyone not want to do for Jesus what He did for us? You see, if we say that we're saved before we're baptized, then we say we're saved without coming forth. Was our salvation accomplished when Jesus was in the grave? No, it took resurrection, didn't it? It took all of it, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Otherwise, we've got a dead man in, in a tomb. But He came forth, you see. In the same way, baptism also now saves us, you see. Romans chapter 6, verses 1, like as He was raised from the dead, glory of Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of His death, we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. So the full action is involved in order for salvation to be achieved. Well, you're in Christ because salvation is in Christ. Unless you're in Christ, you're lost, friends. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10, he says there, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. All right? Salvation is where? In Christ Jesus. How do I get into Christ Jesus? Galatians 3.27 again, I'm baptized into Him. Acts 4 and verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other name, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So that's not in the name of Baal, or not in the name of Allah, not in the name of Muhammad, not in the name of Shinto, or, or uh, Hindu, or Hindi, or whatever it might be. We are born into, and there's no, John 14, 6, we must come through Christ, friends. And we must put on Christ in order to be saved. And we put Him on in baptism. Well, we're lost also unless we're in Christ because redemption is in Christ. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom, watch it, we have redemption. How? Through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Colossians 1, 13 through 14. Somebody says, well, now wait a minute. I thought the water saved us. We never said that. This passage is very clear that the blood saves us. We have redemption through His blood. But where do we receive that blood? In baptism. That's where it's received, not received anywhere out, outside of baptism. All right? So then we're also baptized into Christ, and we're baptized into the kingdom of the Son of Love at the same time. So you, we're going to deal with that a little later in, in the program about is the church important? The kingdom of the Lord's important, and the kingdom and the church are synonymous terms. We're also lost unless we're in Christ because eternal life is in Christ Jesus, friends. 1 John 5, 11 says, And this is the testimony that God's given unto us, eternal life. And this life is in His Son. That's very clear, isn't it? It's not in Islam. It's not anywhere like that. It's in Christ Jesus. It's not in Joseph Smith. It's not in Mary Baker Eddy. It's not in Charles uh, Cal or, or John Calvin or, Char or uh, John Wesley. It's not in any of those. It's in Christ Jesus. It's not in, in any man. It is in Christ Jesus. Life is in His Son. Eternal life is in Christ. All right? So is it hard? Are we putting it together as we go through our lesson tonight that we can get it come out of being lost if we are obedient to the Lord? If we are in Christ, if we do what He has told us? We are new creatures in Christ. Therefore, if anyone, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and everything's become new. 
when I used to do work in the jails, I would take a piece of paper and I'd tell people, okay, this is a piece of paper and these are all your sins. And that doesn't even begin to cover them. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to wash them all away. And so we have a clean sheet. Okay? Everything's new again. Who's going to give you that second chance? One like that. Who's going to give you this deal? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All your sins can be done away with. That's great news, isn't it? All the guilt you're carrying around from all the things you've done. And many of you that listen, and I know there are some of you that do listen that are hurting. And you watch this program and you, you, you want to do right. You want to do the, the right thing. But you just feel so bad about the way you've lived that you just don't know if there's any way you can do the right thing. Yes, you can. That's the good news here. You can have a br brand new life if you come be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friends, again, nobody will ever give you that kind of deal. No matter what you've done, you can be freed from that. How horrible it might be. Someone says, can a murderer be forgiven? Can a child molester be forgiven? Can a mass murderer be forgiven? Yes. By men, not always. By Christians, better be. If they're obedient, sincerely. But do they still have consequences to their sins? Yes. They may die in a gas chamber because of their horrible sins, but they could be free in Christ. There's a thief that admitted that he was guilty and deserved to be on the cross. Remember that? He said, but Jesus doesn't deserve to be up here. Do you know that he's the one that knew the nature of the kingdom on that day? It was the thief. And that's one of the reasons I believe that the Lord said, you'll be with me in paradise. They were both living under the old law. And it seems like that the thief knew something about the kingdom. I don't know where he ran across Christ or heard his teachings. But he knew enough about the kingdom to know that it was not an earthly kingdom. And that brings out the idea that he must have known something about who Jesus was and what he had been teaching, in, in, or John, what they'd been t teaching and saying, or one of the apostles. Because he says, I deserve to die. Paul also was ready to admit that if he had done anything against the laws of Rome, he refused to die not. But he could have died in right relationship with the Lord, see? And that's the same way with us. We might, we'll have to, we don't get away from the consequences of our sin. A person has committed horrible sins of, of the flesh, they may have to have a disease the rest of their lives. That won't go away when you're baptized. But it will, you will be freed from that sin, and it'll be washed, wiped away, and you have a whole brand new life, friends. All the life of sin you've committed can be done away. Don't you want that? What relief that would be. You might finally get a good night's sleep, a restful night's sleep, not just closing your eyes and going into a coma, but actually getting up rested the next day. You know, if you have any kind of conscience, and you do if you're watching the program, then if you have a conscience of any kind, it's hurting you right now, isn't it? And you may feel like such a sorry individual, but the Lord can take care of that. But you have to submit to Him. There are people that have grown up in the body of Christ, the true church, and some of you are listening tonight. And you have been grappling with the right way and trying to find the right way and trying this and trying that and just rebelling against the Lord all of your life. And your life is moving on. You have dissipated your body with drugs and alcohol and all types of things and women and men and you've just dissipated yourself horribly and you're feeling the guilt and you know that what you've been doing has gotten you exactly where you are, maybe in jail, maybe on parole. Hadn't been working too well, has it? Trying to guide your own steps doesn't work. And notice this, the answer to that type of life is a full surrender. Not a partial one, but a full surrender to the Lord. I can't do it on my own. I need the Lord. And I know that it was Jesus that died for me to save me from my sins, and so I need to be obedient to what He has said. And there is nothing He can tell me to do that I won't do. 
and I won't sit and argue with him. I'll just do it. That's the attitude we should have, and it will be lost until we have that attitude. All right? So think about that and ask yourself, are you a new creature in Christ? Are you that new creature in Christ? Do you not know, Romans 6, 3 through 5, that as many as us were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? So we are buried with Him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we should walk in newness of life. And here's that passage again in Romans 6. Now we're in Christ when we're baptized into Christ. Romans 3 and verse 27, we've been bringing this up all night. Christ died for the church too, friends. You're lost if you're not in the Lord's church. If you're not worshiping like you should, then you're lost. In Acts 20 and verse 28, take heed to yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Jesus purchased one church with his blood. You have to be a member of that one. He also purchased your pardon with his blood. You can't be saved without the blood applied to your sin, and you can't be saved without the other thing that he purchased with his blood, and that is the church. So you can't have them independent. We've had some callers, one called last, our last show and said, you know, do I have to go to church to be saved? Yes. But you don't have to go to a denomination because that's just pounding sand. But you do have to be a member of the Lord's church and you have to be active in it and doing all you can to serve the Lord. And that doesn't mean you have to be a preacher or you have to be someone that's in leadership, but you do have to be growing in your talents and putting your very best in service to the Lord. Whatever you can do in service to the Lord, you do that in keeping with His will. And you're added to the body of Christ in Acts chapter 2. Look, if you will, in Acts 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and prayer. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved, verse 47. So we see there that the Lord adds to the church. We are added to the body of Christ. And we join ourselves to a local congregation of God's people that are doing, following God's plan and worship. And we are members there. But we can't be saved outside the body of Christ. We have to be doing what God said in the church. Christ gave Himself for the church. Ephesians 5 says, Husbands, love your wife, wives as Christ also loved the church. Here it is. Watch it. And gave Himself for it. That's verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Well, the saved are added to the church. We talk, talked about this, verse 47, that the Lord adds you to the church. You don't have to be voted on. You don't have to wait for a second work of grace. When you're baptized into Christ for remission of your sins, the Lord adds you to His church. And then you have to worship like He's told you to do. The husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the, is the head of the church and He is the Savior. Here it is, verse 23. He's the Savior of the body. Okay? So all those that are in the church, the Lord is the Savior of. Okay? And unless you're in the church, the Lord's not the Savior of just everybody. It's those that are obedient and comply with what He has told us to do. Now, when we hear this, we should have the response they had in Acts 2 being pricked in our hearts. The message of the gospel. Be pricked in your hearts. Let God's Word convict you. Be touched by what the Bible says, not by some feeling that you get, but let the Word of God prick you. And there are feelings involved in that. You realize, I've just missed this. I have thought for all of my life I was doing this the right way. And I've been missing it because these passages are ungetoverable. This is exactly what the Bible teaches. And I haven't done it. You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a heroic admission that I have been wrong. That's hard to say. Those words are hard for anybody to say. No one says that it's easy to admit your errors. But admit them we must. And turn from them and comply with God's will for our lives. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and are, have all been made to drink into one Spirit. All right? And He has put all things, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, under His feet, and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, comma, which is His body, the fullness of Him that fills all in all. Now turn to Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. It starts off this way. 
There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Starts that off by saying there's one body. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says He is the Savior of the body. The church, He's the Savior of the church. It is His body. Colossians 1, 18 says the same thing. Church, comma, His body. So if there's one body and He is head over all things to the church, which is His body, then how many churches are there that are pleasing to God? One. And that's not something I came up with. That's what the Bible teaches. Now we have to be faithful Christians. And to all those who think that you don't have to do, do anything to be saved, that once you're saved, you're always saved, and you can't do anything so bad that the Lord would ever, ever condemn you again. Well, that's a convenient doctrine and certainly uh, fits into a lot of lifestyles, but it's just not true. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. If you don't have your Bibles, we're going to turn there now. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. Wow! The Hebrew writer is saying all of us need to be careful and give heed to the things we've heard, lest we, that's, that's personal, isn't it? Drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, confirmed to us by those that heard Him, God bearing witness both with signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Spirit according to His own will? You're without excuse, friends. And why? We have to give earnest heed to those things. All right? Just reading the Old Testament, we know that God's people could fall away. They did fall away. And they went into captivity for 70 years for doing that. And so falling away, it was, has always been a, a, something that God's people can do. Now we're faithful Christians if we have spiritual minds. Romans 8, 5 through 9, notice it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh. But those that live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, or of Christ, he is not his. Okay? Now that's not some better felt than told experience that the Spirit just jumps on you and you don't have any control over it. Notice we dwell in the Spirit when we dwell in the Word. The Word is the means by which we know that we dwell in the Spirit of God. Spirit delivered the Word. So if I'm doing what the Spirit says, I am dwelling in the Spirit by influence and by uh, activity that is done through the Word of God. Well, let's look again at some other things. We're faithful Christians if we believe to the saving of our soul. The just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, look, did you see that? Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. The just live by faith, but if anyone, who's the anyone? Those that are living by faith and are just, if any one of those draws back. What does that mean? He says, my soul has no pleasure in him. Wow. But we are not of those who drew back to perdition, but of those that believe to the saving of the soul. So your faith takes you further than just verbal assent. It's followed up by action. Saving of the soul by obedience to the gospel. But notice the passage here. You're looking at that? I didn't... You make sure that, I'm, that I've got it printed right. The just shall live by faith, but... If anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Does that teach, friends, that you can fall from grace? It does, doesn't it? Why would Paul say, I have to watch myself and buffet my body daily, lest after having preached to others, I myself become cast away? Why would he say that? Why in the world would he say that? If it was impossible for him to fall away from the Lord. Because it was possible. And it's possible for you and I. Now we are kept through faith of the gospel, and that's absolutely true. But we're not impenetrable 
from sin. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Those of you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. All right, so we're kept by the gospel. We're kept through faith for salvation to be revealed. We are saved now, but there's a, uh, not totally because salvation is fully realized at judgment. But we certainly are saved from our sins when we abide in the doctrine of Christ. But we don't realize that salvation, the rewards of that salvation, until the end of time. Well, are you a faithful Christian? We have to be faithful unto death. Notice that. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, John says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. That's the last sentence in the, in the whole verse. All right? Notice these are people that have been tested, and they have been suffering, and they've been going through some hard things, thrown into prison and all that for the cause of Christ. And he says, but you, all you who have been through these things, you be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. You can call now and speak to me on the air if you'd like. If you don't agree with anything we've said, please call and let us know what you don't agree with, and we'll be glad to talk with you. Or you can uh, leave a question with one of our operators, 828-485-5555. Call with your Bible questions, friends. That's what the program's about. And you'll enhance our program by calling. This is your program, too. So please give us a call. There are a lot of mistakes that a lot of people make. You know, the crowd does not always lead us the right way, does it? There are a lot of mistakes that a lot of people are making. In Hebrews, Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, Jesus answered the Jews and said to them, You're mistaken. You don't even know the Scripture, and you don't know the power of God. Now, these were the most, uh, arguably, the most religious people of any society of any time. And He says, You're mistaken. You don't know the Scripture, and you don't know the power of God. Now, friends, does that not describe many of us today? Can you be mistaken? You know, I'm finding more and more Christians that won't admit they can be mistaken. If I ever get to a point where I'm not willing to examine where I am, I've been a member of the church for 50 years. And I want to tell you something. I still need to be ready to examine my life or I'm done. If I think that I know it all and there's nobody can change me, I'm in trouble. If you can call in tonight and show me by the Scriptures that what I'm teaching is wrong, I guarantee you that I will come on the next program or if, it's, if, it's, if you show me from the Scriptures, I'll do it tonight. I'll change what I'm teaching. And I've been teaching these things for a long time. Not only will I do that, but I'll make it clear to people that I, everybody I can, that I've been teaching error all my life on this subject or that subject. I'll let it be known. Because I don't want to be lost. And you shouldn't either. So we don't want to ever get to the point where we just think we can't be mistaken. Honest people, we can be honestly wrong. Did you know that? You can be honest. Have you ever taken a wrong turn and you just knew it was the right turn? Did you do it because you said, I'm going to take the wrong turn. I'm going to do it on purpose. No, you didn't do it that way. You honestly thought that you were going the right way. Do you suppose that can happen in religious matters? That you think the path you're going on is the right road, only to find out it's not. Yeah. I drove all the way to the store the other day and knew I had my wallet in my pocket because there was a heavy thing in my pocket. It was my phone. I thought I had my, I went to get gas. You know what? I couldn't get any gas. I didn't have anything to pay for it with. I didn't have a driver's license. I hope nobody marks me a ticket. But I didn't have anything. I thought I did, but I was wrong, you see. I had no reason to think I wasn't right, but I was wrong. That can happen to any of us, can it? We honestly think we're right. And if you're watching the program tonight, I think all the viewers, I'm, I'm going to give you everybody that's, that's watching tonight, I think that all who are watching tonight don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be wrong. But the fact is we can be, isn't it? All of us. I'm willing to admit that, are you? I could be wrong. Hmm. 
And if we ever get away from that, we'll stop studying God's Word. If all we're doing is studying God's Word to validate what we've always thought, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And a lot of people make that mistake. Well, I know what I did, and I'm not going to back off of it for anything. You, I've heard people say, you can give me a whole stack of Bibles, and I'll not do, I'll not do any of that, because the feeling I've got here is just all I, and I, well, when somebody goes with that feeling business and say, that's the way I feel, and I know this happened to me, you have no basis upon which to approach them, because they've gone away from the Bible being the authority. They're going with their feelings, you see. That's how I feel about something. Mistakes are costly. It can cost money, sorrow, friends, loved ones, children, mates in our life. Mistakes do that. Friends, there are some people running for office right now. Do you know why they're so, both of them, so unpopular? Because they can't say, I messed up. Both of them. And I don't care what your party is. That's a common trait of politics. People can't say they're wrong. They spend tons of money writing big speeches, never admitting that they messed up. Do you know it would be a breath of fresh air in this country if all people who make mistakes would say, I messed up. Do you think of a compassionate people, there's any one of us that say, well, we're not forgiving you. Because we all have that in common, don't we? I mess up, you mess up, all of us do. We can be wrong. But millions of people are going around and they're losing their money, they're losing their, their friends, their loved ones, their children, their mates, and their life because they simply cannot find it in themselves to say three words, I am wrong. Might be a problem in your home. Having trouble with your wife or your husband and one of you or both of you might be wrong. But neither one of you, too, both of you, too stubborn to say it. I messed up. Two words, sorry, uh, uh, very, very difficult to say. I'm sorry. Two more words, difficult to say. Help me. You see, short words, but very meaningful, right? Short phrases. But if we could just find it in ourselves to be able to say those things and not puff ourselves up arrogantly and say, I know what I'm doing and I don't care and I don't care if I'm the only one that believes that. And I don't care what the Bible says, I'm just going to believe what I believe and I, if people don't like that, I'll divide everything I can find. No, 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 no. Back off, get your pride down and sit back and say, you know, I'm not all the people and wisdom doesn't cease with me. As Job told one of his wonderful counselors, he said, I'm not, certainly you're all the people and wisdom stops with you. What else do you have to say? Let me be sure to listen to you. You say men can be wrong and Job admitted that. Job said that to his friends, that all of you are miserable counselors. When we rely on our own words, friends, we are miserable counselors. We're miserable preachers. When we just rely upon what we think and what we do and that's what we preach. We're miserable. And we're not doing anybody any good. We might as well quit preaching and go out and retire somewhere and raise cattle because we're not doing the kingdom of the Lord any good but preaching error. Well, many people have mistakenly lost their souls because they have followed the idea that I can't be wrong, cannot be wrong. Many people make the mistake also, millions of people make this mistake. They presume, they suppose, and they guess that they can't understand the Bible. I want you to look at some passages. Let's go back to our charts here. John 7, 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. He says there, there's a difference. And a person that really wants to know the will of God will know. You can see the clear distinction a mile away in God's Word and men's words. But you have to look at it. You have to examine it. And if you want the truth, friends, if, you, if you're really searching for the truth, the truth is there. It's not hidden. You can find it. But you won't find it as long as you're looking at it 
through your rose colored glasses of what you've always believed and you can't admit that you might be wrong. In Ephesians 5, 17, therefore to do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Here Paul tells the Ephesians, you can understand what God's will for you is. You can know that. You don't have to have a preacher help you. You don't have to, have to notice that. You can understand that. All of us can understand what God's will is for us. Now we may have to have some help, Romans 10, and some of the details of that, but notice this, that we can pretty well see it if we are guided by what the Word says and not guided by what some man says and not polluted by the th thoughts of the world or denominationalism. We can understand what God's will is. Where we have problems is we try to make God's will fit our will. And that's where we stop seeing things. Many people presume, suppose, and guess that ignorance is an excuse. So I didn't know it. And uh, so as, as long as I don't know something, I'll be all right. Acts 17, Paul talking to those on Mars Hill says this, the times of this ignorance God winked at or overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. Because He's appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He's given assurance of this to all by, the ra by raising Him from the dead. That's Jesus. All right? If you don't know about that, and the people on Mars Hill could have probably made the claim, we don't even know this God, but notice they were still responsible. They were still accountable to God whether or not they knew it or not. And there's a lot of people today that say, well, I don't want to know anything about the, uh, the Bible because if I know, then I'll have to do it. Nope, that's a mistake. A lot of people suppose and guess that sincerity is sufficient. Well, I believe I'm right. I'm, I'm sincere in what I believe. Look at what Paul said in Acts 26. Paul was quite a character, wasn't he? Notice what he had been doing. He used to be a murderer. Did you know that? He was, he was a, uh, complicit in the murder of a lot of people and in jailing people that were innocent. He says, I thought that I must do many things that were contrary to the name of Christ. I did think that, he says. Indeed, I thought that. This I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison and received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I voted against them. So Paul was complicit in the death of many Christians. And I punished them, he says, often in every synagogue, and I compelled them to blaspheme. Wow. Paul was one of those guys. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. I chased them down like a bounty hunter. And I had my papers from the Jews, and I went after them, and I was vicious in it. And I made no apology. But he said, I did it in a good conscience. I did all these things. Paul says, you know, if he was going to make the argument that majority is right, he could have gone along with all the Jews and died in that condition. But Paul could say these words that we talked about a minute ago. I was wrong. I was wrong. In Matthew 7, 13 through 14, I think a lot of people lose sight of this passage. This was uttered by Christ. Enter in by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there's many that go in by that one. Because narrow is the gate and difficult the way that leads to life, and there are few that find that. Friends, the gospel that many people preach today in churches is that everybody's going to heaven, that heaven will be overflowing, and hell will be people rolling around like marbles, just a few of them that were so stupid they couldn't find out the right thing. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus said this, there's a narrow gate, and you enter by that one. No other way. You enter by the narrow way. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Here it is. And many find that. Some people conclude that the majority has to be right. How could so many people be wrong? Do you know the cause of Christ started out very slowly? 3,000, and then 5,000. And somebody says, well, that's a lot of people. Yeah, and it was preached all over the world by the end of the first century. But friends, in comparison with what everyone else was believing, it was still a minority. Still a minority. 
Someone says, well, you know, it seems like you have bigger churches. If, what did Jesus tell us? This is not always going to be the most popular way. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a big church. We want people that are saved to come, to, that, that want to be saved to come to the Lord. And so that will increase number, and that's what we're all about is bringing, because souls don't need to be lost. But the fact is, the sad fact is because many presume, they guess, they suppose, that they need to go where the crowd is. They need to know, go where the big ones are, where the big bunch. Bigger's all got to be better, right? Really? You know better than that. We've tried that in politics for years. And it's not working, is it? Not working at all. Well, you know that in the church the same way. There's a lot of people in a lot of different denominations. But all of them aren't right, are they? All denominations are wrong. And so there's a narrow way that leads to life. And it's not always going to be the biggest church in town. Because the gospel doesn't appeal to the majority. Notice that. Not many high, not many mighty are called. They, that doesn't mean the Lord doesn't want them to come. But the appeal, they've got too much going on. They've got too much pride to give up what they believe. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 20, he says, which formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Someone asked, uh, the one that talked about uh, them being baptized in the flood that we dealt with at the beginning of the program. They also said, well, you know, may, maybe there was more than eight souls saved. No. First Peter 3.20 says there's all, that, that there was... Just eight souls saved. That was it. Out of all the people that were in the world, the thoughts of man were only evil continually, and Moses or Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, he and his family. And they were the ones that were saved. Somebody says, was God, was God just love to be mean? No. He, pray, he had Noah, Noah also preached for over a hundred years trying to get people to repent. None of them would because they thought the majority has to be right. They supposed that the flood wouldn't come. They supposed that Noah was crazy. They supposed that nothing would ever happen to them, that they could live like they want. And they were bulletproof and they found out when the flood came that they'd been wrong. But it was too late. Some believe that God will give us a free pass. In Numbers chapter 20 and verse 12, read this with me if you will. Numbers 20 and verse 12, let's go back there if we can. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and said here, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you will not bring this assembly into the land that I have given you. Did God require of what perhaps was one of His most noble servants that He be obedient to what He said? He did. Moses and Aaron, though, did not get to go into the Promised Land because they did not believe the Lord. Now, did they believe in the Lord? Yeah, but they didn't act on that belief. They didn't hallow God in the eyes of the children of Israel. They made it look like they were bringing forth water instead of God bringing forth water. And he says, because of this, he says that the problem was not that you uh, spoke to it or hid it. That wasn't it. The problem is you didn't believe me. You didn't follow what I told you to do, so you didn't believe me. If you didn't follow me, you didn't believe me. Same thing is true today. In Romans 11:22, consider the goodness and the severity of God. On those that fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in His goodness. Otherwise, you'll all be cut off. Wow, we have to continue in His goodness? Yeah, we have to continue. God is exacting, even of His own people. He would be unfair. He would not be a just God if He expected was exacting of people in the world, but not exacting of us, wouldn't He? He expects us to walk to a high standard. Millions of people fail to realize the value of their souls, friends. Matthew 16, 26, what profit is it to a man though he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? How much did you sell your soul for today? 
What sins were you guilty of today that you can enumerate? How cheaply did you sell your soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Relationships sometimes. Sometimes he'll prefer his church over the truth. Sometimes he'll prefer this or that. He'll just do what he wants to do. What has a man profited if you die the richest person in the world but your soul is lost? What have you, got? What have you gained? They're not going to put a trailer hitch on the hearse, are they? You haul it with you. It won't happen. Well, millions of people fail to realize that they have an individual responsibility. In Romans 2 and verse 6, Paul tells the Romans that God will render to each one according to his faith. Doesn't say that, does it? Notice, let's go to it. He will render to each one according to what? His deeds. His deeds. Now there are some of you that call in and say, well, you know, you don't have to do anything. What does this say? The Lord will render to each one according to his deeds. And friends, that's not work salvation. That's just doing what God said. If you do what God said, you get rewarded. But if we do evil, we'll also get, a, get, get something, and that's damnation. And that's not pleasant to think about, but that we, we'll get what we deserve, what it comes down to. You're working for something. You're working for evil, or you're working for good. You're working for salvation, or you're working for damnation. One of the two. But we'll, God will render to each one of us according to what we've commensurate with what we've spent our lives doing. In Romans 14 and verse 12, so then each one of us will give account of himself to God. You're not going to be saved because of the righteousness of your mama or your grandma. You're not going to be saved because this one was saved or that one was saved. You're going to be saved on the basis of what you've done. Give account of yourself to God. You ready to do that tonight? In the condition you're in right now, are you ready to give account to God for what you've done? He's going to render to you according to your deeds. If you died, did not make it tomorrow until tomorrow, two seconds past your death, what will you be wishing for? Or will you be totally content in paradise? Think about that. Many people fail to realize that God wants us to please Him and not ourselves. Well, God, does God want me to be unhappy? Well, if it means my soul will be saved, yeah. Yeah. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Now, friends, the Lord wants us to walk and please Him. He wants us to be pleasing to Him and do the things that He's told us to do. He wants us to abound more and more in His service. And many people fail to realize that that is an action. That's a work that we must go through. We don't, we're not put here to just be happy and please ourselves. You ever heard a young person say, I don't want that job because it doesn't make me happy? Well, when did we get the idea that work was always something that we just thought was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Works hard. Works tough. And sometimes you won't always be happy because this world wasn't meant to last forever and this world's not a happy place sometimes. But we weren't put here to please ourselves. We're put here to please the Lord. All right? Now we must obey the Lord. Many people fail to realize the necessity of obedience. And to you that are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with the angels of, uh, of His power in flaming fire, rendering vengeance to those that know not God and to them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer punishment from eternal destruction from the face of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Now friends, the necessity of obedience. We must be obedient to what the Lord told us to do. Many people fail to realize this. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, if the Lord learned obedience, do you suppose He wants us to? Though He was a son, He learned obedience. How? By the things He suffered. And having been perfected, He became unto all them that obey Him 
the author of eternal life or eternal salvation. Now, friends, if the Lord God in the, in the Son of God, in Jesus, if God in the flesh, Jesus, Emmanuel, learned to submit to His creation and to learn to submit by the things He suffered and made perfected by that, notice the parallel to that, He wants us to obey Him. He obeyed, and he, an argument could have been made, He was so much greater than anything that He submitted to. But He learned obedience. Why did He do that? Show me how to. Now to those of you that say obedience has nothing in the world to do with salvation, you've got to have an argument with Jesus Christ, because Hebrews 5 says that that's what, exactly why He came. He learned obedience by the things He suffered. But obedience, yeah, He subjected Himself to His own creation. And he didn't do that because that was, that was something he just felt like that morning. He did that to show us. He left us a path on how we should walk. We must be obedient to the Lord. The necessity of obedience. Now, some people fail to realize, too, that they are accountable to God. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we'll go back to that. He says, we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. Go back to the chart that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has what? Watch it, has done, whether it's good or bad. Each one of the things done in the body, we receive to that. We'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give answer for the deeds that we have done in the body, whether it's good or bad. Now done, that's action. So we must do the good things of the Lord. In Romans 20 and verse 12, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the books, according to their what? Faith? No. According to their works. Judged according to what? Works. To those of you that have called in and said, well, works has nothing in the world to do with your salvation. What are you going to do with Romans, or Revelation 20 and verse 12? Do works have something to do with your salvation? We're judged on the last day according to our works. So it's at the basis upon which we're judged. But many people say, oh, it has nothing in the world to do with your salvation. Yes, it does. And I'm going to prefer Christ and what the Lord said every time over what you say or what I say. Because all of us could be liars, but God's Word's not. Now you just can't get over Rome, Revelation 20 and verse 12. We'll be judged according to our works. Does works have anything to do with our salvation? Yeah. Has everything to do with it. Does that mean that we work our way to salvation? Nope. But we do not, we're not saved unless we work. Unless we work the works of the Lord. We're not saved by our own works, our own meritorious activities. No, sir. You can't map your own way to heaven. Can't do that. Can't, you couldn't do it if, if you lived three million years. You couldn't do that. But you will not be saved unless you submit to God's will and do what He's told you to do. Many people, however, put their trust in their own conscience. In Jeremiah 10, verse 23, friends, very clear. Jeremiah, a long time ago, said, I know that the way of man's not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own path. We are horrible at directing our own path. You know, if you were just to decide one thing that God does and it became your responsibility, could you make the sun come up every day? Could you do that? That's just one thing he does. Could you work all things together to everyone that loves God? He does that too. Well, you can't even work out what you want to do tomorrow, can you? But God works all things together for those that love. You take all the magnificence of God and you try to think about whether you're capable in any one of those of mapping it out. What would have been your plan of salvation? How would you have done that? You don't even know, do you? You know, and if you do begin to reference that, you reference it on something God's already done. 
You have no clue in the world how to save yourself, and I don't either. But the Lord has given me a way. He said, I'll tell you how. Follow me. Do what I said. Obey me. You love me? Okay, then just keep my commandments. And trust me. I've never been wrong. Never will be. And I've given you a path to walk, and I've given you a word. I've given you a whole book of directions. Follow them. Do what I said. And don't argue about it. Don't be like an insolent child saying, oh, I know what it says, but I ain't going to do it. No, no, no. That's no way to please God. We must submit, okay? He submitted to His creation. You can submit to God, can't you? In Acts 23 and verse 1, Paul, looking on the council, said, Brethren, I have lived before God in all good conscience toward this day. But notice he had just talked about how he had put people in jail. But he did it in a good conscience. In Acts 24, 16, again he says, I exercise myself to have a good conscience, void of offense toward God and men, and I've always had that conscience. I always thought I was right, but I wasn't. He says, and I today think I'm going the right way, but I've got to buffet my body daily to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Now friends, that's a daily walk, and it's constantly realigning yourself with God. That's what it is, constantly. And we bring ourselves in line with what God says, not align God with what we want to do, you see. Totally backwards. Many people misplace their trust today in people in the clergy. There are those of you that call in from time to time and you call me reverend or you call me pastor. Uh, understand this, I appreciate you wanting to uh, show some honor or to respect, and I appreciate that. I'm just a person, and I appreciate your attitude, but don't call me reverend and don't call me pastor because I'm neither one of those. I'm a gospel preacher, and that's it. I'm a person. My name is Stan. Last name is Adams. And call me that because that's all I am. I'm no more special than you are. I can be mistaken just like you can. Notice in Galatians 1, 6 through 9, many people are going to place their confidence in the clergy or the hierarchy of a church. Certainly they would not lead us wrong. They know more about the Bible, we assume, than we do. But you know what? That's not always true. You know, the majority of people in the hierarchy in churches don't even believe in the miracles of the Bible. Did you know that? Did you know the seminaries today are putting out preachers that, that are standing in pulpits, and some of them are where you are, and they've got a great 401k, and they're taken care of for the rest of their lives, but they don't preach the truth because they don't believe the truth. It's a job to them. And they get up, and they say what they have to say to fit into the denominational rules. They get their prayer book each year that tells them what sermon to preach, and they get up and cough that out, and they don't even check them out to see if it's true. And many people sit there in the assemblies and just assume because that's a clergy person or that's a preacher or that's a pastor or that's uh, somebody that's a father or whatever we call them in our denomination that, that they have to, not, they, they won't read us the wrong way. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Have you got your Bibles? I marvel, Paul says. Galatians 1, 6 through 9 on the charts that you're turning away so soon from him that called you in the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. But there are some who would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so say we now again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you've received, let him be, what? Accursed. Be accursed. So no one has the right to lead people the wrong way, and people are being led the wrong way. Many misplace their, their trust. In Ephesians 4, 4, 4, 14, though that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, how? by the tricks of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plots. Notice that. We don't need to be carried about with how impressive someone can make an argument. By the craftiness of deceitful plotting. Do you know that describes many even in the body of Christ? They're not honest. 
They are out promoting their own agenda and they're binding where God doesn't bind and they're loosing where God didn't loose and they're plotting. And he says here, don't you be carried away by every wind of doctrine. Don't you be carried away by the tricks and the deceits of men. And men can do that and be careful about that in the church. That's how we have the problems we have in the denominational world today. Because everybody's following their man, whoever it is. Some misplace their trust in the doctrines of men. In Matthew 15, 8 through 9, Jesus says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart's far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrine the commandments of men. So their teaching is what? Their own commandments. And they're worshiping in vain. Are you worshiping in vain? Because your church is teaching you doctrines that aren't of God? In Romans 16, 17, and 18, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you learned and avoid them. You got that? You mark them or you note those that cause divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrine of Christ and avoid them. That's true of Christians, true of people in denominations. And here's why, he says, for those that are like this or of such, they do not serve Jesus Christ, but they do serve their own bellies. And by dis smooth words and by flattering speech, they deceive the very hearts of the simple. The simple are those that don't study. The simple are those that are new converts. The simple are those that don't know any better. And these people are going to be judged for that. And he says, brethren, you mark everyone that does this because it's serious to go around and bind where God didn't bind and loose where God did not loose. Well, one that does not trust in the Lord when he fails to do what Jesus commands is a fool. And the Lord sets up. All right. Luke 6 and verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not, here it is again, do the things I say. Works has nothing to do with salvation, preacher. Tell that to Jesus. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I said? Is that works, friends? Correct me if I'm wrong. I may be the dumbest person on the block. Maybe I'm missing something. Because some may be, you know, evidently, I don't agree with a lot of people out there that say works have nothing in the world to do with salvation. I'm going to kind of go with the Lord on this one. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I said? That's pretty clear, isn't it? Whose side are you on? You're going to go with what your church says? You're going to go with what the preacher says? You're going to go with what you've always thought? Or are you going to do what God says? You're going to follow what the Lord has said to do. See? Doesn't do any good to just call him Lord, Lord. Matthew 7, 21, frightening passage to people that are religious. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he, here it is again, he that does the will of my Father in heaven. Works has nothing in the world to do with your salvation, preacher. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus thought it did. Luke 6, 46, Jesus thought it did. You're going to argue with Jesus? You can argue with me all day long, and my, you may prove me wrong. But when I'm reading God's Word and you're reading God's Word, it's not wrong, friends. Doing the will of God. Works does have something to do with your salvation. It does. We have to do the will of the Father in heaven. Can't be saved without doing that. You know, a whole lot of people today are, are making the mistake of not studying the Word of God for themselves. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, Be diligent to present yourselves approved of God, a work, worker that does not need to be ashamed, dividing properly the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now think about that. Is there a way to wrongly divide it? Yep. You could. And still be using the truth. And that's what happens. The scriptures are read like this individual, this Mr. Geisler and this Mr. Howell that we talked about in our first part of our program, they're, they're reading the same passages I'm reading. They're just making them say something they don't say. Okay? I have to rightly divide the word of truth. I have to see what God says on something. They also go on and say, John didn't say anything about that. Well, Matthew and Mark did. 
They both mention baptism. Well, let's say that John nor Luke said anything about it. Matthew and Mark would cover it, because that's God's Word too, isn't it? And that's about Jesus. So Matthew and Mark chose to include those. The other writers didn't. So who knows why that's the case, except that God chose to deliver it in one account, but not in the other. God wrote the Bible. Do you believe all the Bible, or you just believe what John said about Jesus? Now, you'd have a very, very short story about Jesus if you're just going to go by what John says. He gives more of a synopsis, an overview of, what, of the life of Christ from the eternal viewpoint. But you wouldn't know much about where he was born, about what town he was in, a whole lot about that. Just cover that real quick. In the prophecies, you would not know, if you just looked at John, you wouldn't know whether some of the prophecies came true. Right? But notice, we do know that John was inspired, Matthew was inspired, Mark was. But you see how people twist it? And people say, well, you know, that seems to make sense to me. Well, you're not studying the Bible if you think that, because uh, if one writer didn't say it, that it never was said. Somebody says, the Bible doesn't ever say anything about baptism for remission of sins. Jesus never said it in those words. Wait a minute. But Peter did, and Peter walked with Christ. And the Lord said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. And he says, I'll give you the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. And he told all the apostles that. And so they wrote as they were holy men of old, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we see there that God has given us a word that is guided by him. In 1 Timothy 4.13, notice Paul tells Timothy, until I come, give attendance to reading, give attendance to exhortation, and give attendance to your doctrine. You give attention to that. Because you can drift away, Timothy, young preacher. That can happen to you. In John 5 and verse 39, Jesus says this, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are those that testify of me. He says, you listen to what I told you. You search the Scriptures. You check out who I am you'll find out that the Scriptures testify of me. But you have to search the Scriptures to see that. And on any subject that God wrote about, we have to search the Scriptures to find out what His will is. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, it says, Test all things, and hold fast what is good. You put everything to the test. You put it on the test of God's Word. Is this something that God's Word teaches? You know? Does God's Word teach what you think? Or do you want what you think to be taught in God's Word so you make it say it? See? A whole lot of difference in that, isn't it? A lot of people neglect to guard against error. And millions of people do that. Many in the church do that. Somebody comes in among us and say, Ooh, they're nice. They seem nice. They've got great jobs. They live in a nice neighborhood. Oh my, they're wonderful people. We don't check them out. You don't know that, do you? Many people neglect to guard against error because, notice this, a warning from Jesus Himself. Beware. Watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They'll shred you. They'll destroy you. You watch out for false teachers. They appear to be ever so harmless but they can be ravening wolves. I've never known a false teacher of any kind in my experience and in, in the years I've been in the church that wasn't a nice guy. Very personable. A lot of them, big cut-ups, nice people. I could be one of those. You know that? I think, I've had people tell me, you're a pretty nice person. Be careful of me. Be careful of everyone. Don't you ever get so close to someone and be so impressed with their personality that you just listen and do whatever they say. Don't ever let that happen. Because Jesus warned that any one of us could be someone that appears to be ever so harmless, but inside and inwardly have an intent to tear up and to rend apart and to destroy. You watch out. All of us members of the church, people in the world, watch out for those that come among us.
Now many neglect to guard against error because notice 1 John 4 and verse 1, he says, Believe not every spirit, but try them, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out in the world. That says many people that are teaching error are going out in the world. Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul told the Ephesian elders, from among their own selves men would arise teaching perverse doctrines and leading people away to themselves. So a lot of false prophets out there that have gone out into the world and they're drawing away disciples after themselves. They're politickers. They with smooth speech and flattery will deceive the hearts of the simple. So watch out. In 2 John 1, 10 through 9, 10 through 11, this is what the Lord says to do with those people. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, do not receive him into your house. Don't greet him, for he that greets him shares in his evil deeds. Pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty clear. Well, millions make the mistake of neglecting to render obedience to the gospel. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey? Whether of sin that leads to death, or whether of obedience that leads to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, you have obeyed the, from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Obedience. Now notice here it does not say, turn, let, let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. Let's go to the chart. Notice what the passage doesn't say. Go down to, to where we say, God be thanked. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you, let's read it like some people wanted to say, let yet Jesus saved us by grace only, and we didn't do, we don't have to do a thing because Jesus did it all for us. Romans 6, 16 through 17. That's how some people want it to read. But that's not what it says. God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed. What did you obey? The form of doctrine that was delivered. You obeyed what the doctrine of Christ was. Notice that. You were slaves of sin, but you became slaves of righteousness. How did you do that? By obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how you do it. That's how we do it. Okay? Well, be faithful. Many, many people today that are Christians neglect to be faithful in their service. You may see them every other Sunday or every month, but they're not faithful to the Lord. They're not serving the Lord like they should. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10, last part. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering in the time of my departure, a hand, Paul telling Timothy this. But he says, I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but now he puts himself, he tells us how he has this hope. But I have this because I love his appearing. I have been preparing for his appearing all my life. And I'm ready for it. I'm a prepared man for a prepared place. I have to be faithful, friends. Well, you can call and speak to me on the air right now at 828-485-5555. And call with your Bible question, if you will. Uh, also, go to our website, www.wordandsword.com. The number again is 485-5555, 828-485-5555. Thank you for being with us tonight. I want you, if you will, to think seriously about where you are in relationship to the Lord. And we talked about church membership also. We, we're going to close tonight with that point. Does it matter what church I go to? Is it really important? Do, I go to, do you go to church because of social reasons, because of business associates, to drum up business? Do you believe the church's job is to sponsor everything that you do? to provide every type of entertainment, to be a cheap country club? Do you go along with the contemporary services that are out there and the traditional delineation? The traditional and the, the contemporary? 
there are a lot of people that don't go along with what their churches are. So the church has decided, well, until all the old people die, we'll do a traditional service. But then understand this, we're going to be all contemporary at some point. When all the money goes away, when all the people die, and some of them may even leave their money to the churches, then all the young people will take over and do what they want to do. Well, that's how digression takes place. You know, one generation falls away and dies, the righteous people die, and then there you come, the generation that knows not God. Now, church membership, the Lord said we must be members of the body of Christ. Jesus said, I'll reveal my church on the confession that I'm the Christ, the Son of God, Matthew 16, 16 through 18. In Mark 9, 1, that church would be uh, in the first century, would come in the first century. I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Some here will not die until they've seen the kingdom come with power. When the power came, the kingdom came. Power came on Pentecost, and the church was established on Pentecost. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, Jesus Christ. The church, by the way, friends, is not the spiritual building. Notice in 1 Peter 2, 5 through 6, Notice, therefore it is also contained in the Scripture, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believes on him will by no means be put to shame. You're a holy priesthood. You offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God. That's who you are, a spiritual house. That's what the church is, the saved of God that are spiritual, not the physical building, all right? So again, when you say, I went down to the church, and you're talking about you went down, you can't go down to the church. You're, the church is the called out of God. You're a person. You go to church. Well, we know what that means. We use that accommodatively, but what we mean, we're going down to the building. But the building is not the church, okay? We have to understand that. The building is not the church. So Christ bought the church. Do you know that? We talked about that in Acts 20 and verse 28 tonight. Dealt with that already. And in 1 Timothy chapter, or 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19, you're redeemed with corrupt, not with corruptible things like silver and gold for your aimless conduct received by the traditions of men, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So all those that are bought by the, love of, by the blood of Christ are in His church. Christ saves us and puts us into His church. The church contains the saved. Acts 2, 47, the Lord added to the church daily, who? Those that were being saved. So the saved are in the church. Now, what is the purpose of the church? To preach the gospel and to edify and to practice limited benevolence. Those are the three works of the church. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Now, that's individual Christians doing that in Acts 8 and verse 4. Well, notice here, the church is to uphold the truth. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15 says the church is the pillar. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. That is the support system for all truth. It does not say in this passage that the church is the exclusive pillar and ground of the truth because each one of us individually, and some of us if we wanted to act collectively, could be the pillar and ground of truth too. We support. In that we support the teaching of the gospel. We we abide by the teaching of truth. We support that. We are the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, the church is not the exclusive, doesn't hold the exclusive patent on that. And the Lord never said that. He says, I write so that you may know how to, you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Nowhere in that passage does it say that everything that is done in the way of teaching has to be done through the Lord's church. Okay, Me and a couple of the guys that are here, the operators, could go out and start preaching the gospel on the street corner and never even call anything, say anything to the church about it. We just preach the gospel. Just do what the Lord said. And we could even rent a place and do that. And do, do that on our own. It wouldn't be have no, anything to do with the church. Okay, And so we have an obligation to do that. We wouldn't be taking over the work of the church. All right, so the purpose of the church is to glorify God. Okay? We are to help needy saints. But notice it is not the exclusive job of the church to help needy saints. Any Christian could do that. Families are supposed to help needy saints. If your uh, loved ones are members of the body of Christ, you're supposed to take care of them. And you do not undermine the work of the church when you do that. Okay? 
You can even use a, another system to do that. You can even use someone that's uh, a nursing home or some organization to take care, help take care of your family. You could do that. You could pay them to do that. You don't undermine the work of the church in benevolence when you do that. Okay? So understand that. Well, how is the church governed? Well, Christ is the head of the church. And notice he is the chief shepherd. But notice here, Peter says here, the elders that are among you, that is elders in the local church, I exhort whom a fellow elder and a partaker of the glory, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but wicked, but, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. But be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. So there's admonition to elders to make sure that you have the right motive in leading the people. And it's not to promote your agenda. It's to do what the Word of God says, not any more, not any less. And know how to make those clear distinctions or you're not qualified. Not qualified to be an elder. Now, notice that elders are how God wants His church organized, elders and deacons. But notice that if there are no qualified men to be elders, you don't need elders. All right, the Lord has other ways to work, and churches existed without elders for a while. The shepherd, the, notice that the elders are to feed the, feed the church of God and make sure they, te they feed them the truth and only support the truth. We'll give account of what we say. Now, how do I become a member of the Lord's church? I have to hear the gospel. I have to believe it. All right? And I have to believe in Jesus Christ. He said, and the, the eunuch in Acts 2, or Acts chapter 8 says, here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? And notice he, he said, if you believe, you can. So I have to believe in Christ. And then I must be baptized for remission of sins. I will repent of my sins, Acts 2, 38. I am told to confess Christ as my Savior in Acts 8, 35 through 37. And I must be baptized. Somebody says, that's a lot of things to do. No, no, that's what God said. Let's, let's suppose the list was ten times longer. Would it be too long to do? Well, He's given us five things to do, basically, and then we live faithful to death, so six. Let me ask you something. Is that a lot to ask? Notice all of those things save us. And we have a whole list of things that we have a chart on. If you'd like it, please call in to our operator and we will get you that. The chart that tells everything the Bible says saves us. Okay? There are several things the Bible says saves us, but no one by itself. Okay, that's where we get into trouble. Saved by faith only, saved by grace only. I'm saved by grace only, by faith only. Or I'm saved by baptism. Or I'm saved by confession. Or I'm saved simply when I believe. You know, not anywhere in the, in the Bible, friends. So we must be baptized for the remission of our sins and added to the body of Christ when we're baptized. We put on Christ then. Now again, you can call in, talk to me on the air at 828-485-5555, call with your Bible question. We appreciate the time you've given us tonight to come into your home, and we appreciate so much the opportunity to teach you from God's Word. If I have taught you something from God's Word that is not in the Bible, do not believe it. I've tried to give book, chapter, and verse for all that I've said. If I haven't done that, then I haven't been what I should be as a preacher. But if I've taught you the truth, let's all abide by it. Me too. Because it's the same gospel for all of us. We are all bound by the same truth. We're not bound by anybody's opinion. Nobody's opinion is binding. But the truth is. So let's all try to do what the Bible teaches us to do and abide in the gospel of Jesus and the doctrine of Jesus Christ. If we go onward and do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, 2 John 9 says we don't have God. That's a bad, bad place to be. We're going to go back and ask you a question that was asked at the be and, and toward the middle of our program tonight. What will you give in exchange for your soul? And then ask yourself the question, am I lost or am I saved? If you're living a wicked life and you're sitting there saying, I don't think that I could ever be right with God or that God would never forgive me for what I've done, know this, that you can become a new creature in Jesus Christ. And we want you to. That's, what we're, that's why we're doing this. 
We want you to know the truth and let this truth set you free. But you do have to change the way you live. You're not going to, Jesus never, you remember when Jesus was feeding the 5,000 and people, and people came and started following him because they'd heard that story of how he fed everybody? You remember what, how he refused to feed some other people? He said, I'm not feeding anymore. They've come for the loaves and the fishes. He never said, in John 6, remember when people were departing from him and leaving him, and he asked his apostles, will you also leave me? And he told them, he said, and they said to him, he said, who shall we go? Who, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. We can't just go to anybody for the truth, friends. The Lord has those words of eternal life. And we must recognize that we must go to him. Remember that Jesus did not pair back on what he was saying and saying, go get those people. I overstepped and hurt their feelings and I'm going to change my message. He didn't say that. You know, Jesus came right out with it. He said, you know, if you follow me, you'll be poor. You'll be, as the world looks at it, you'll be made fun of and you'll be persecuted and you'll love every minute of it. That's what he said. He said, it'll be for your best. Notice that. He said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of the Lord, you have to become a slave. Hmm. He didn't, he didn't minimize the message because, and a lot of people didn't like that message. Just frankly, a lot of people, the, the, the Jews, they were too proud. They didn't want to do that. They didn't want to be slaves to anybody, including the Lord. So they walked away. They didn't hear him. They, they put him on a cross and killed him because they didn't like his message. Friends, you can kill the messenger. This message is still true. Men were successful in killing the messenger at one time. But the ringing of the gospel is still here today. And nobody is ever going to be saved without it. It'll be true in the year 3000 if we get that far. And it was true in the year 33. Same gospel. And if you're here thinking about being obedient to the gospel of Christ, call us and we will do what we can to help you accomplish that tonight. You don't need to die in sin, friends. You call us and we'll help you to find the truth from God's Word. If you need some guidance, need some help, need some study, want a home study, want to study the Bible online, whatever you would like to do, we are here. We're all about that. And our time is your time on those things. You please let us help you learn the Word of God and you abide, don't you accept anything we say if it's not from God's Word. How long has it been since you heard anybody say that to you in a church? You know, that's common in the Church of Christ. It's common. Tell us where we're wrong and we'll correct it. Because we don't want to be lost. You see, we can be wrong. Can you say those words? Can you say, I'm sorry? Can you say, please forgive me? Can you come to God humbly and say, I'm here to be your servant and I'm ready to be obedient to all you've said? Thank you so much for allowing us in your home. We'll be back on September the 8th and we would urge you to, uh, to tune in then, uh, the first Tuesday in September, and we would love to be back with you. Thank you for gracing, uh, letting us grace your home tonight. You've been our friends tonight. Thank you.